did what they were supposed to by the textbook. They cut rates and they had a huge fiscal stimulus. I mean, a monster fiscal stimulus. Probably the biggest one in the history of modern economics. Relative to the size of the economy, yeah. The size yeah. of the economy. And they were like, all that did was create a big bubble for us. A big housing bubble made it worse. And so the worry now is these guys are going to throw the baby out with the bathwater, say, our economy is slowing and we're worried about it, but we're scared to use pro cyclical economic policy. And so they're stalling a little more on cutting rates, lowering reserve requirements, and trying to finesse So you think it. they don't quite know what they're going to do? No, I think there's a risk that they're too hawkish, that they wait too long and they make a policy error and keep rates too high and the economy slows more than people think it does. Well, Jim, what would make you change your short on the Chinese banks or, or, or even Chinese real estate? What would make you change your mind? Lower prices. <laughs> <laughs> So basically a bubble bursting. No, I mean, I, you clearly, <laughs> when the, if the evidence changes, if we suddenly see a reignition of the housing market and transactions and prices begin moving up and, and you know, suddenly uh, uh, feeling that the credit problems are solved. But try as I, I may, looking through the windshield and not the rearview mirror, I can't see a scenario as to how they get off this conundrum of over-relying on investment. Hmm. It just, every time there seems to be a problem, they stick a shovel in the ground and start a new project. And inexorably, by the time you build your third international airport on Hainan, <laughs> you know, we're two of them pretty much empty. I mean, um, At some point. It's really hard to justify the fourth and fifth. You might do it, but, um, I, and I think that that's, that's the problem here. Steve, I mean, you spent time in Beijing. I mean, you spent several years there, right? I mean, would you agree with what Jim is saying? I'm probably more bullish in the long run than, than maybe some other people because I think in the long run what makes countries successful is uh, their educational system really is what in the long run makes a difference and this is a country that is composed largely of one-child families because mm -hmm. of the one-child policy. To say that the students uh, in China are motivated is one of the great understatements of all time. <laughs> the percentage of income that families spend on educational supplements like Sunday, Saturday school, Sunday school, uh, test prep in, in China is it's something like 10% of a, of a typical family's budget. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's very difficult to have a long, long run view that's uh, short given the incredible amount of human capital I mean, based that's on, being built. Based on what they're investing in education, you're saying it's very difficult to have a, a bearish view on China. It's just their general industriousness. I mean, you go there and it is shocking how hard people work and what's going on. But there's, there's a big problem, that is, will Western investors see anything from that? And that's what I'm a little more concerned. I, I have no doubt, I'm, I'm a big fan of Chinese culture and the long tradition of China innovating, you know, well before the West in many areas. <clears throat> the problem has been probably more there than almost any other place down through the centuries is that Western investors have not been treated well. I agree with that. And, and so you know, those of us sitting around this table or in the canyons of Manhattan and London may not benefit from this great economic growth miracle. We definitely won't benefit. I always have a little exercise when people tell me they own uh, Chinese stocks. I, and, and when I ask them what they own, they say, well, I own a consumer company. I say, well, where do you own it? And they say, well, I own the eight shares in Hong Kong. I say, well, you don't own anything. And they sort of always look at you like you're looking at me. <laughs> and, and I said, well, examine the structure of how you, of the ownership of what you own. You own a Cayman Islands corporation that has been floated for the exact reason to take capital from Western investors, put it back through the Caymans and back into a mainland company affiliated with the Cayman company. And typically you have a profit participation or you have a dividend arrangement or you have some sort of look through, but you do not own the assets of this company. So, so hang on, Jim. So, are, are, Jim, are you saying that, that anybody who is investing in any of these Chinese internet companies that have IPO'd, mm -hmm. or any of the companies that are listed here, or as you say in Hong mm -hmm. Kong, are being swindled? I'm not saying they're being swindled, but I think that and every company is different. Every structure is slightly different. But by and large, the blanket statement is you don't own the assets of the company operating in the mainland. You have some sort of operating agreement, some sort of investment agreement, some sort of profit sharing agreement with them. But you are not a direct owner of the company doing business in China. In which case, if they were to go under, you'd have so no rights. So there are real governance issues here, as, as well as some, on top of the well-known accounting issues that we've seen. Betty, for a lot of investors, 
the actual China play isn't as important as China growth, right? The, the rest of the world, outside of someone who's investing in a specific Chinese company, cares, is China going to continue to consume the lion's share of commodities in the world? Mm -hmm. Are they going to drive global growth, right? They're the second largest economy. They're growing at, you know, eight-ish percent. Right. Mm -hmm. The law of large numbers makes it harder for them to keep growing at that level, but they're having a bigger and bigger impact on the world. And so for most of us, we've got our finger on that pulse thinking, geez, if these guys stumble, hard landing, growth falls to, you know, low sevens or six. Then we're all in trouble. It has a major impact on the rest of the world. Steve, is there a big short in Chinese real estate that's similar to what we had here? Jim makes a very compelling case. The only thing I can say is, uh, despite all the, the construction, the average you know, Chinese person still has a lot less living space than the average Western person. Right. That would be, yeah, a, uh, a, a potential you know, read to stand on to, uh, to, to take another side. You lived there for two years? I lived there for three years. So do you think that there's any chance of the place you know, um, having social upheaval? I think, yeah. The, the old line is the economy stupid probably applies just as much in China as it does in the U.S. Mm -hmm. The economy continues to be strong. I think there's very little chance of of, of upheaval, to be honest. Um, well, as long as they have jobs, what do they have it, to complain it, it about? It was quite then, interesting. Right? We, we met with two senior Chinese officials right after the, uh, the Arab Spring started, and, you know, it was shocking how fast they shut down the Internet out of their nervousness, right? If you Googled uh, Arab Spring, you know, in the Chinese Internet, you got nothing. And if there's a perception of the game is rigged, people are going to revolt. It's right. what happened in both Libya and, yes. and, and, and in Egypt. And, and quite frankly, if you look at our kind of U.S. revolt against Wall Street in 08, there was a real perception. Finally, business TV on your iPad. Introducing Bloomberg TV Plus. It's Bloomberg Television Live 24-7, plus original programming, exclusive interviews.